Welcome back to season two of Authentically Peculiar with Marcia. I am your host, Marcia Blaine, a licensed professional counselor, a clinical hypnotherapist, an author, motivator, and life coach. Join us during the season as we begin to normalize freedom. Authentically Peculiar with Marcia. Welcome back, welcome back, welcome back to Authentically Peculiar with Marcia. Coming to you in season two as we are preparing to launch this season of normalizing freedom. Tonight, we are blessed to have what I consider as one of the most beautiful and authentic souls on this planet, Charnay White. Y'all can call her Dr. White. I get to call her Charnay. Let's go ahead and get that air clear. Because years ago, and I thought about this today, Charnay, I have known you and interacted with you at least eight years, yeah. at least eight years, which blows my mind because it seems like just yesterday, but it blows my mind. So I'm going to read her bio. Y'all listen up at the end. After we discuss religion and mental health, I know that's a juicy topic. I know that there are so many t-shirts out now, get Jesus and a therapist, all that kind of stuff. We're going to talk about all that tonight. But I want to introduce you formally to Dr. Sharnay White. She is the mother of three beautiful babies that are anointed like their mama. Y'all got to watch her on social media because you're going to get the opportunity to hear her and those girls sing. You know, I got four. Four. Oh, little I got the, oh I got the boy. I know. He's, boy. he's snuck I in on boy. me, so I get it. <laughs> But she, she hails from Fisk University with a bachelor's degree in music, vocal performance, and she uses her gift of song to capture those along her path and to help them reach into themselves for that healing. She has her master's of divinity from Howard University, HU, a master of science in school counseling, and she has more than 20 years of combined experience as a youth pastor, a chaplain, a Christian writer, a school counselor, and a certified Christian counselor. Dr. White is a writer, a preacher, a teacher, a counselor, and an all around lover of God. Above all else, she lives by her father's mantra, nothing beats a fail but a try. As I stated, she has four beautiful children. That's my bad. Journey, Angelina, Trinity, and John three. She is a young woman. And I can say young woman because I'm, you know, more than a decade older. <laughs> <laughs> she is a young woman that I've looked up to since the first time we interacted at Capella University. Her thrive, her spirit of excellence. Her anointing is so drawing and encompassing that she makes anyone that comes in her presence feel warm and welcome. And then y'all, I know y'all caught it. That killer smile. I know y'all got it. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. That, that smile will pull you in. Ooh. So I introduced to some, perhaps reintroduced to others, Dr. Sharnay White. Thank you for being here tonight. Greetings. Thank you for having me. Marcia is always, as Les Brown says, a plum pleasing pleasure as well as a privilege to be in your presence because I've learned so much from you. Um, you know, we did meet at Capella and that was just the beginning of our journey. Mm -hmm. And so it's been a good eight years. I have seen both of us just grow tremendously the pandemic seemed to be like a turbo booster you know mm -hmm. how people say you know you send the you send the shuttles up and then the rockets have to fall off you know the yeah. boosters have to fall off and so mm -hmm. it seems like we have just been letting go of all kinds of things so that we can be boosted and you are definitely peculiar and authentic and I love everything about you you have gotten me through some challenging times myself so I commend you. Taking on a podcast is a really big deal. And I just pray blessings over all of this. I am really honored to be here tonight. 
Yes, oh, that's so beautiful. I, I'm so grateful. I'm always, my mother always said that you always appreciate people for where they are because they never have to say yes and they never have to support. And so when I reached out and you was like, yes, I'm in and let's go. That was a, just a true uh, awakening for spirit too. And when you came back in oh, season two and you came back and you said, you know what? Freedom is my word. And I was like, yes, that's when you know that you are literally operating in a place where God will have you to be. So let's jump into it. Let's do it. I think that the discussion of religion and mental health is very interesting. And it has its own dynamics, specifically in the Black community, because, you know, we are based in, in religion, you got to pray to God. Don't talk to nobody else. Talk to Jesus. You got to, you know, go to church and all those kind of things. What are some myths that you've had to address in regards to mental health and religion? So there are lots of myths and some of them are actually kind of crouched in some of the statistics that you hear. So mm -hmm. I want to kind of go from um, a data perspective first before I get into kind of like the couch and, you know, the, the couch and the little seat type of situation with the mm -hmm. therapist, because I think that a lot of mental health has a backdrop that is put out there for both practitioners practitioners and those who are actually um, taking advantage of mental health, like clients and children in schools and all of this. Um, but I, I, I saw a few statistics out there and I've heard them before, and I'm sure that you've probably heard them yourself. Um, one in particular is African-Americans utilize mental health services at about half the rate of Caucasian Americans. Mm -hmm. So, um, I don't know about that statistics. I have I have some questions myself. I don't mm -hmm. know a whole lot of people that I am connected to. Now that could be my six degrees of separation. It mm -hmm. could be my professional social location, my vantage point, my mm -hmm. perspective of who I'm connected to. Mm -hmm. But I also feel that it's important that when we see statistics like that, that we don't fan the flame of that mm -hmm. reality. And I do think that there's a little bit of a myth buster in there. I mm -hmm. think that's why it's important. And I just want to put a plug in for anybody interested in research. Research is just a discovery. That's all it is. We don't have to like mysticize it or make it some incredible thing because you get a degree. At the end of the day, you can be your own myth buster by changing the narrative. Yeah. So don't let the statistic fool you and make you think because this is an ideology that people of faith don't align themselves with mental health that right. you have to be a part of that story that doesn't have to be your story exactly so that's kind of like you know my little I want to bust that myth wide open mm -hmm. I think that it may have some truth to it mm -hmm. but I think that's also dealing with trust of African-Americans on any level with anybody trying to psychoanalyze them because yeah. we have come through so much bondage of trying not to be psychoanalyzed and controlled. Mm -hmm. You know, talk about just being right off the cusp of slavery, really. I mean, we're yeah. generations away too, maybe just three, just a few. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I need you to really just dig in and think about how these myths play a part in your life. Mm -hmm. Now, when you get on the couch, right, when you think about just your sister friends or getting in your family or, you know, hanging out with your sisters from your sorority or, or just people you knew in college or wherever mm -hmm. you got your folks from, people have all kinds of weird conceptual ideas about the alignment of faith and mental health. Yes. One of them is it's not biblical to have a therapist. That is the most craziest thing I ever heard in my life. I've had That's people tell me that. <laughs> yes. yes, it's just like you don't hear, you didn't read in the Bible that there were so many counselors and wisdom and elk. Oh, okay. So, okay. Yeah. And, and so the Bible is laden with wisdom. You know, you can have your, your, your different thoughts and, and ideas about the Bible itself. But at the mm -hmm. end of the day, you have to really think about what is it saying about being wise, having knowledge, and having understanding. These are three key words that are 
sometimes used together or somewhat interchangeably in both the Old and the New Testament, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to the Psalms and the Proverbs. So when people tell me, I don't really need a therapist, I just trust God. I'm like, okay, well, what are you reading? Like catch mm -hmm. me up on your literature because if you're reading any scripture, it'll tell you to get understanding, to get, to get knowledge, to get wisdom. And then all you're getting get understanding. Get understanding. Yes, ma'am. And how I usually reply to those statements is, oh, well, if that's your perspective, then why do you go to a doctor? If that's your perspective, then why do you seek an attorney? If that's your perspective, why do you go to school? See, God anointed us all with certain gifts. Now, granted, we know that in every genre on this planet, you got some scrubs and some scammers, right? Mm -hmm. You have to actually put yourself in a position to be open to hear if that's the right person for you to actually show your levels of vulnerabilities. What are some other myths outside of a, it ain't in the Bible? Well, some of some of the myths are that if for some reason I tell somebody my story, that um, I could be judged. Mm, I don't okay. I don't like that because you know mm. God says that we shouldn't judge one another. You know that's right. what the Bible says. Right. And and somebody gave me this term today um, in one of my sessions. They said you know people like to cherry pick the Bible. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, and I and my response was I wouldn't even know how to handle the Bible if it wasn't for cherry picking because it's a big old book with it's a whole a big bunch of words. Book. So mm -hmm. if I don't if I don't pick something out to kind of chew on and digest, how else would I would I be able to deal with it? You know, I think a lot of times people get caught up in this idea that judgment is bad. Mm -hmm. judgment is not bad and therapy is not judgment so and that's like a, that's a well they find another judge another therapist exactly but of course this is because people are intrinsically and it doesn't matter if they're if they're a, a person of faith or they're not a person of faith people intrinsically fear being judged they fear yeah. being judged by strangers that don't know them from adam's dog but mm -hmm. they will go to great lengths to avoid any manner of hard conversation with someone whether they know them or not mm -hmm. so a lot of the myths that align with people of faith and mental health are really global myths about mental health in general I think what, what highlights them for the people of faith that in some way it almost insinuates, and this is kind of mm -hmm. like a third leg of a myth, that if I confide in somebody and I don't, you know, trust God, then mm -hmm. in some way God is not pleased with me. Mm -hmm. As if that if you have wise counsel, which it's it's notated over and over and over again to sit in wise counsel, I don't know where people think they're going to get it from. I don't know where the wise counsel comes from if it's not through your mental health practitioners. Now, if you take some of the verbiage out and you look at some of the, the clinical pieces or you look at some of the ideas of how we become wiser or mm -hmm. how we have more rational thinking or how mm -hmm. we're more cognitive about who we are, then people start getting a little bit of understanding because yeah. now they don't feel like a case. And mm -hmm. I tell people, we are all cases. When they bring in that little file in the doctor's office, in the attorney's office, as you have well stated, uh, when you go walk into that, that office at school and that principal is, is telling you about yourself, guess what? We all have a case okay, and we case. all have a case manager. Oh. And that person is whoever's in charge of that particular area of our life. Mm -hmm. And so, and the Bible says it to be foolish to go and build without having adequate materials. Yes. How in God's name can you build the house of your soul, of your spirit, mm -hmm. this place mm -hmm. that you, your body, if you're not represented properly? Right. Yeah. So it's a lot of little, I wish they were balloons and I could just pop them. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I wish, I, I, wish I could just pop them because I want people to understand. And I know this is a part of your passion, truly to be authentically authentic to yourself. You okay. have to know that there is something outside of you to support yes. you and to bring some things out of you that's already inside of you. 
So why not take a chance? What could you lose by being vulnerable and allowing somebody to be a part of your life and be on this journey with you? And, And you know, the thing about it is, is that part of people's fear is that discovery. What am I going to discover about myself when I go to therapy? Oftentimes, they'll use a mass situation such as, well, God didn't tell me to go to a therapist, so I don't need a therapist. I just need to pray because they don't want the discovery. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, I I get that. Um, That in, in and of itself is very similar to growing in the faith. And I don't want to get ahead and, you know, start talking about religion versus relationship, but the closer you get to getting to know yourself, truly who you are, what you've been called Mm -hmm. to do, um, it's going to require some things. It's going to require some other people. It's going to require some evaluation. They don't just give us these certifications and licenses and, you know, all of these associates, they don't just hand us this stuff. We have to study to show ourselves approved. And so I, for, for whatever reason in your mind, whatever you're thinking, you can get what you need by getting mm-hmm. to know more of yourself. Yeah. It's scary. Listen, I heard a preacher say, I don't know why you think somebody want to go out here and hook up with you. You don't even want to hook up with you. Listen. Can we talk I, about I, it? <laughs> I, I posted a message a couple of years ago and it simply said, would you date you? Mm. And people, you know, in, in their fictitiousness, the mask, yeah, I date me, I think I'm this, this, and this. And so then I would hit them back with different questions. And it's like, oh, I didn't know you was going that deep. It is that deep, right? Could you look in the mirror and say to yourself where you're judging other people and their religious belief and their relationship with God, can you actually look in the mirror and say, me and God, we straight. Mm. I'm good with my relationship, I understand where I am. Can you actually do that and be honest with yourself? What I find oftentimes, I had someone to say to me, because I'm a clinical hypnotherapist, you turned your back on God. And I said before I knew it, girl, when you actually are skilled up enough biblically to have a conversation with me, we can talk. Because oftentimes, and and, and my other favorite line is, line is, I eat meat you're still eating baby food. When you join us at the grown folks table eating meat, then these statements wouldn't come out because you would know because the Bible, there's nothing new under the sun, right? Ain't nothing new coming. No, ma'am. Everything that was going to be created is already created. We have to actually tap into within us, like you said, that assessment and understanding who we are in relationship to ourselves and then in relationship with God, then we could talk about religion and we could talk about all this other stuff. But if we don't have a relationship with ourselves, then, then what? I got something for you. What do you think happens when people go through all these social media, almost dislike social media because it's just so fake, but they go through social media and they see I'll give you an example. Tabitha Brown and her husband has a podcast. And she said on the podcast, no, I don't always go to church on Sundays. But I spend a lot of time in my Bible and in worship and praise and Thanksgiving. There was a slew of people that attacked her. Hmm. What do you think the message would be to young people that need to even know how to build that relationship and mental health? Because we're going to talk about the church wounds. But what are your thoughts about that? Well, I have learned that church is a membership. Mm-hmm. Hmm. And so that's why some people don't go. And, some people don't go. <laughs> and, and that's why some people don't go and some people do. Mm-hmm. They treat it like a membership at Planet Fitness, the Y, Mm -hmm. Um, and they want to go where they can get as many amenities as possible. Mm -hmm. Um, And then there are others who understand that the church is a house of prayer Mm -hmm. and that that's where you're supposed to gather with the assembly of like-minded believers. Mm -hmm. And then there are those that view uh, the altar and Mm -hmm. the pastor as the church 
Mm -hmm. So your concept of the church is different, especially in America for everybody. Yeah. And so we are the church. The people are the body. Now, God always manages to call his people back to him. History shows us that. Where this is not the first mm-hmm. you know, time that we've had some type of disease in the land. Mm-hmm. This is old hat. Mm-hmm. People being quarantined is old hat. Mm-hmm. People having to wear masks and stay away from each other is way, way old biblical. Way, mm-hmm. way old, 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 old. So mm-hmm. I think for some reason, when people hear people say, I don't always have to be in the church to have a relationship with God. Sometimes people who are associated and affiliated as church members, they see that as an attack on the faith and as a lead or as a, and I don't want to, you know, t- I don't want to put the whole culture on Tabitha's back, but as a spokesman, kind of like somebody who is a woman of faith, a black mm-hmm. woman, somebody who's entrepreneurial, somebody who we all kind of look up to and just think is amazing. Mm-hmm. For some reason, we think that she doesn't have the right to be like us and get to choose how she develops her relationship with God. And mm-hmm. I think that is, I think it kind of falls short a little bit. In fact, I don't really worry about when people say things like that. Yeah. Um, I know that the Holy Spirit is like the internet. It transcends. You're there, I'm here, but we're together. And that's really what the Holy Spirit is. That's the relationship. That's the relationship. That's the relationship because even before we started, they, of course, we didn't record the prayer. But even before we started, we went ahead and invited God and the Holy Ghost in to guide us through the conversation. People don't see all the behind the scene work. They see what they get in their face, right? And so when you are in relationship, you don't need to explain it. And that's my opinion. And I, I do think it. that and you don't have to explain it. And Tabitha owes us nothing. Like, I mean, we need to be grateful that she's out here. Uh, putting out products oh, and giving mm-hmm. us options for better eating. I have had some gastro issues lately, so mm-hmm. I need to get on whatever she's on and change my life. So that's, yes. that's why I put yes. her as one of my besties in my mind. But, you know, at the end of the day, we have to be able to allow people to have relationship with God. And remember, God always knows how to assemble his people. Yeah. Because we're looking at it from a forsaking of the fellowship and not being inside the body. Listen, we find reasons to get back into the house of God. I am so not concerned. Now, let Mm -hmm. me say this with a caveat. As someone who loves Jesus Mm -hmm. and prays that I live a life that people will see him in me and will Mm -hmm. want to know what it is about me and I'd be able to share that it's him. I do want people to be in the fellowship. Yeah. I find so much meaning in being with like-minded people in mm-hmm. prayer. Being away from it, I have felt the absence. Yeah. yeah. So to say that there's no absence in a pandemic when you're used to being in fellowship and the coldness of not being with your brothers or sisters or being at an altar. You know, mm-hmm. you can create your own altar at home. I actually recommend it. But mm-hmm. I also know how sacred that space is because it is a building erected for the edification of the Lord. Right. So does it have meaning? Yes. Does it matter? Yes. Is it important to be in fellowship with like-minded believers? Yes. Would God in any way assume that we need to be all huddled up in the middle of a pandemic or right here on the tail end of it, wherever we call, we call ourselves being? Right. Absolutely not. Mm-hmm. I know for a fact that God loves me most. That I know. And I know that he doesn't want that for me. So, you know, I'm talking to somebody specifically today Mm -hmm. or tonight, whenever you're listening to this, I know that in your mind, there's a way that's either right or it's wrong. Mm -hmm. But I just think that there's a little more facet to the body than right and wrong, because the word says that all things work together for the good, the good and the bad. Mm-hmm. Still work together for the good. I wish mm-hmm. folks would have it alone and let her be great. Just come on but, now. You know, I, I just found it funny. I was like, oh, God, you will let me see this today when we get ready to do this interview. You know, I've often said to people, to me, that the fellowship is the gas station. You go to church to fill up so that you can go back out and actually express and change. And then you go back in for a filling. I think that sometimes people get too fat on gas because they don't go out and actually move 
the information it, or it often moves through, you know, judgment or different things like that. We yeah. have to be very mindful that in understanding that, listen, we are created wonderfully made and a peculiar people, not here to actually judge, but to bring unity. And if our words aren't lifting other people, what are we talking about in the first place? Listen, you know what is so amazing about what you just said? You're using vocabulary that we hear a lot in mental health. Mm -hmm. mindfulness um i'll even bring into the conversation meditation mm -hmm. we talk about mental we use these different words all of this is based in faith right but for some reason because you know the world has kind of taken on some of these concepts we mm -hmm. think we're bringing the world into the church or we're bringing it into the body or we're bringing it into salvation when in fact yeah. and and the bible talks about it god says the people of the world know my ways better than me better, mm -hmm. better than, know my ways better than the the people of god right right so and i'm saying me because i was thinking about it being yeah. me but yeah. you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. and i think that we need to recognize listen it's something serious when you're going back and you're taking back language that actually belongs to the body. It Period. belongs to the body. So when Tabitha and her husband or any of our more, I feel like social media giants, uh -huh. um, Kev on stage, you look at, uh, not Carlton Banks, you look at all these different people and yeah. where they are and you think about what their root is even the laughter that they bring or the nutrition, the ideas, the concepts, they're all based here at the foundation. Don't write that and honor and respect and acknowledge. Y'all, I can't do this without God. I don't know what you got going on, but I can't do this without God. And understanding that I used to say years ago, just because my hand doesn't move like this or my handkerchief doesn't go like this or my hallelujah doesn't sound like your hallelujah, that doesn't mean I'm less than. That means that my relationship is demonstrated from a different perspective. That's just me and God. That's the thing that's cool about God is everybody can come to him however they want to. That's right. It doesn't have to mimic everybody else it's about their relationship you know we could be doing this thing all night i know it i know that's right and so let me ask you this question how do you incorporate religion in your in your therapy sessions so i've had people from different backgrounds different mm -hmm. faiths um most people are interested even if they're not christians they're like i'm just curious because i like you I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, I like you too, you know? No, <laughs> we just find out what we like about each other first, you know? Yeah. Like, okay. Uh, so one of the first things that I do when I have a consultation is I let people know uh, my therapeutic approach. I like mm -hmm. to use a lot of REBT, Rational Emotive Behavioral Therapy. Mm -hmm. I like to use a lot of solution focus, but that's only if a solution is necessary for a particular thing. That's a very simple fix. And actually, that's kind of more like a coaching moment. Mm -hmm. um, I use some solution focus pieces in the counseling session. Um, but for me, where I really kind of like begin the actual faith journey in my sessions is by allowing people to choose how we enter and how we exit. Yeah. Uh, and I think that it's important to always give people choice. I think God gives us choices. Yes. I do think that there's a perfect way, but I think that there's many avenues to that perfect way. I, mm -hmm. I don't think that God, and I, I, I feel like I just need to say that because again, this is some of the roadblocks that people of faith have to mental health that mm -hmm. I can only hear from the pastor. Well, your pastor is not your Busy. providing you pastoral care. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You need pastoral care. And sometimes you can get that through counseling and coaching and mentoring. So mm -hmm. one of the first things I do is I ask people, how would you like to enter and how would you like to exit? I want to mm -hmm. give you two options. Both work for me. Okay. Mm -hmm. And this mm -hmm. is a little nugget from love and logic, right? That mm -hmm. if you give people choices, they should both work for you. Yes. And yes. I have to be able to be me authentically mm -hmm. in the session. Yes. So I say, would you like to pray or would you like a moment of silence? Mm -hmm. And they like choose. That. Now, 
usually they choose prayer, even if it kind of like something they don't really do. But I find people don't really turn down prayer. Yeah. Even if they say a moment of silence at the beginning of the session, usually they're like, listen, pray, doc, pray, do what you do. Because I know that I need something. And I'm like, okay, well, listen, let's just throw something at it, see what sticks to the wall. God is able, you know, and I and I'm able to in my prayer use what I have. Now I may not say John 3 16. Right. But because I have a lot of scripture base, um, and this is be well before counseling, well before chaplaincy, well before divinity, I was just raised to learn a lot of scripture. Mm-hmm. And I can incorporate that in those moments because mm-hmm. that's my understanding of how to use knowledge yeah. and provide some level of wisdom mm-hmm. and to always be insistent in my prayers to ask God for guidance uh, that we're here to sift. My prayers sometimes are very much the same, mm-hmm. but I ask God to kind of move me in the way that, mm-hmm. the, that the session is going to go. So Mm -hmm. that's like my first part into Mm -hmm. as a Christian therapist. Yeah. And then my next piece is, it's kind of the same. Um, Mm -hmm. I'd like to know where people believe their intersection with God is. What Mm -hmm. are your juxtapositions with your faith and your life? How do they work in tandem? What is working for you? What has worked for you? Let's talk about what's working. Right. And so- when people find out that, yes, I'm a Christian and yes, I'm a therapist and yes, we can be all of these things and you can still be you here, then mm-hmm. they're more, they're more willing to say, I don't really know. Like, I don't right. I, I know where I am and I think that's okay. And mm-hmm. I know what I think about God, but I don't know that I have an intersection. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then I could ask them if they would like to develop an intersection. Right. You know, that's how relationship is, is intersection. That's all. Where do we meet at the corner? Mm-hmm. And as African-Americans, you know, we are mentally, emotionally, and in most ways, physically indigenous to certain spaces. Yes. We like to exist in groups. We like to be in our fellowship until our cheeses moved or they just move us all together. Right. We like to be in, in some intersection. And mm-hmm. so I'm able to use not just, not just, biblical precepts, but ideas of how our faith moves us as people. Right. right. And, and that's specifically, you know, for my African-American clients, but you know, I find that it works for everybody. Cause I find that everybody want to be long. Everybody want to be connected. People usually come to therapy because they feel disconnected. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and the, the wounds and the trauma of the past often disconnects us. And then we go searching. Mm. Oftentimes that search leads us down patterns of additional wounds. So that's my next question. A lot of people come into therapy, at least that's been my experience. I've had quite a few clients that come in with church wounds and wanting to talk about those wounds and the healing process. So we dig deep into the wounds in order to get them back. And I tell my clients all the time, listen, my job is help you establish the relationship that you desire with the creator. That's my job. Because I can't do that without being authentic. So I have to warn them, listen, it's the Holy Ghost show up. I'm about to give you whatever's coming hot off the press. Have your pen and paper ready because it's going to come. I'm not changing who I am. Because every gift that's inside of me is supposed to be used to help people be in their best place. So when people come to you to discuss those church wounds, and we're, we're talking specifically about church wounds, but we know that there are wounds from so many different walks yeah. of life. But one of the things that I see constantly on social media is people talking about these church wounds. How do you help guide your clients? to a place of vulnerability to talk about those wounds and then being open to the healing. Yeah. Well, I personally believe, and my faith tells me, um, the teaching that I've had throughout my life, specifically as a therapist and as a Christian Mm -hmm. and as a minister, has taught me that God specializes in the wounded. Yes. 
specializes. So church wounds are like any other wounds. And wounds mm -hmm. need wound care specifically. Mm -hmm. Now, wounds mm -hmm. are not like scratches and wounds are not like something internal. Right. Wounds are kind of like sores that some circumstance or some person or situation opened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I have, and it's, it's so ironic that you asked me this question because I mean, and I did look at it. I knew it was going somewhere, but today I had so many confirmations um, just thinking about some of the things we were going to talk about, about wound care. I recently mm -hmm. had a friend that did not get adequate wound care as a diabetic. Mm. And just kind of keeping in that, that type of analogy, you know, those with diabetes have to be very careful about the wounds that they, that they receive. And mm -hmm. I think that people of faith, especially in the Christian church, we tend to be, um, you know, we, we, I mean, faith is what we live on. So we, mm -hmm. we not only have faith in God, we have faith in each other and faith is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen. Right. Yet right? So you're more vulnerable, mm -hmm. which means that I do kind of expect the people of God to often be wounded. And I, mm. unfortunately, I expect sometimes for those wounds to come from one another. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Because hurt people hurt people, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now I don't in any way think in any cyclical <laughs> way that it's God's goal for us mm -hmm. to hurt each other, but it right. requires wound care. Mm -hmm. So when people come to me and they say, I have a lot of church hurt, I can testify to that. Mm -hmm. I can testify to that as a woman in ministry and, and, and not getting the guidance that I felt like I asked for or that I, I desired. I know what that's like as a person that comes from a large church family. Mm -hmm. um, people expect more of you, even though mm -hmm. you're kind of like, you know, extremity human, human. and mm -hmm. and when you fail you know of course they they it's like you know everybody is there to watch just how much longer you're going to be in this space you know there mm -hmm. and you're gonna fail because that's what people do you know they have right. good seasons and they have not so good seasons mm -hmm. so I've been there I've had wounds yeah and I've had some I, I can tell you some stories about them <laughs> you know but let me tell you I love my relationship with God yeah. Because no matter how wounded I, I've been, and I share my testimony as often as I can, I remember that it is not God that created these wounds, but it is God that can heal these wounds. Absolutely. And it is God that has allowed these wounds. Mm -hmm. Now, are we going to punish the whole fellowship or the whole body? I mean, what do we just, I'd never see people who just love McDonald's stop going because they had one bad fry. Exactly. Exactly. You know, but we, but we, but it's so easy to do in the church. It's just like, why do you think it's so like, easy? Well, people are looking for a reason. You know, the I, church I is a very that. exposing place, not mm -hmm. because anybody's calling you out, just by virtue of you being in the building, people feel like their feet are on fire. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I'm trying to think of I, it's somebody in the back of my mind that keeps whirling. And I remember telling them, what you think gonna happen? That you, you know, you come in here, that you just gonna catch fire if you have to be on this pew with me? Like, what do you think exactly is going to happen? <laughs> but, I, but I understand because there's mm -hmm. some level of conviction just by entering the building. Yeah. Yeah. Now, people say the edifice ain't everything, but everybody wants to find out for themselves. Right. So when you exactly. go in and you feel that, that's what you feel. You feel that level of conviction. You feel those wounds, mm -hmm. those prayers mm -hmm. that went unanswered. Why are my prayers being, why would I continue to, when I went through all of that trauma as a child, mm -hmm. when I had all that adversity, when I prayed that God would help my mama out of this bad situation, or I prayed that my father would come back, or mm -hmm. I asked that we would become stable and not have to go to another school. Yeah. Where yeah. was God? Where were yeah. those prayers? And so I, I have to say, honestly, I don't know. Right. Where was the church? We were faithful. We tied. They let us lay outside. We were cold. Mm -hmm. I don't have anything to do. I cannot deal with the church. I don't know where that money is going. And I, say, mm -hmm. I know that. I know that. So let's just let that be. Right. That's all that you can control. I remember the first time that uh, I spoke from the pulpit. I was 20, 20, 21 years old. 
And it took me some preparation because the fear was real. Sure. Uh, I had to be 22 uh, because I was a single mom. And right before I got ready to speak, uh, one uh, older saint cornered me in the bathroom and said, God told me you're going to be the Women's Day speaker. A do who? Was my response. Was my response. I was like, oh. so I went home crying. God, what is this? What you setting me up for? That kind of thing. So on the on that Sunday morning, the pastor said to me before I actually um, began to speak, he said, "I see your anointing. Don't try to steal my church." Oh. And I said, God, I don't know what this is about, but get me out the way. And that was actually my opening prayer. Get me out the way and come through. And I have people asking me that actually heard that sermon and, and gave their life to God. How did you do that? How did you handle that? And I simply said, it wasn't my battle. Hmm. When we are, when I deal with people that are experiencing church wounds, and you know I was a pastor's wife and all that stuff that goes with that, I have to remind them, listen, the battle that you had with these humans is not your battle with God. If you want to go to church, you find the one that's right for you. If you want to be in fellowship, find the right place for you. Don't allow other people to damn up your anointing. I got it. Because of these wounds, these wounds, nah, they can be healed, but you have to choose healing. Yeah. Healing has to come by choice. That's why I love God, because such a gentlemanly-like spirit. There's yeah. never a force, but there's always a light nudging, right? And yeah. so when you go through that wound healing. I love how you said that, that wound healing part. You have to, I imagine it as you were speaking, we got to scrape off that top layer of skin. We got to pull back all that gunk and pulse and, and all infection. this stuff. Yeah. And infection. And then we have to clean it and sanitize it and prepare it for healing. That's what we have to go through when yeah. we talk about wounds. We got to go through that. How do you break it down for people to really understand? Listen, I hear your hurt. I hear your pain. But what do you say to them to say, okay, let me go ahead and move past the pain at this point? Yeah. Well, I think processing it. Mm -hmm. uh, as we go, we are healed is what our word says. And so... When you think about that, healing is a process. It's a movement. Mm -hmm. As you walk, you are healed. When Jesus healed, as people went away, the healing manifested. It wasn't like instant. Now, I'm not saying he didn't do what he needed to do in that moment. But mm -hmm. you think about the shock to the system. And I, and I used this analogy before how when they shot the heart. You know, mm. it, it can mess up so many things. It can make the heart mm. weaker. It can, it can mess with the veins. It can mess with the blood flow. But to save the life, you shock the heart. Yeah. That's instant healing. Mm -hmm. Most healing is not like that. Most healing is process. Process. So yeah. we start from where you are. We don't start from where you want to be. Mm -hmm. And I mm -hmm. think that for some I reason. I wrote it back. You, you start from where you are, not where you want to be. Mm. And that's why I love being a mental health practitioner so much because I see people coming a mile away mm -hmm. and I think to myself, okay, even though I have an idea, because that's mm -hmm. all revelation is when you, when people say I had a revelation, what they're really saying is I had an idea about something. Mm -hmm. I have an idea about people that come to me. And yeah. when I get that idea, I say, okay, I have an idea. Now I, now that I've got my idea, I have to be open to whatever God may say, yeah. whatever path he may choose. And I have to look at people as dimensional, several dimensions, mm -hmm. not just flat, but all of the many things that has brought them to this, use this term again, intersection. Yeah. So I try to get people to just be present. Mm. We laugh a lot in my sessions. You know, I'm borderline just flat out silly. Mm -hmm. And I like for people to feel the tickle of God again. Yes. 
Yes. You have to kind of awaken um, that fresh anointing. It's hard. I, you know, what makes it so hard is the world is such a hard place to be in. Yes. Laughter is so overprocessed, like pasteurized cheese. I mean, it's just, we just get canned and dehydrated mm-hmm. and everything. So the little organic tickles that the Holy Spirit gives, I like to infuse those in people's process to deal with their pain Mm -hmm. like okay well tell me what the worst case scenario is I don't know well if you did know what would it be right and so we keep whittling it down until we get a word or we get a sentence or a paragraph Mm -hmm. and we just stay there for as long as possible and I I think one of the challenges people don't think they have time to heal because Mm -hmm. we have taught people that they don't have time to heal and that's one of the reasons why People think that they cannot get past their pain. Mm -hmm. I didn't have time to finish learning those standards in Mm -hmm. K-12 education. So I didn't do as well in college. And when I, when I got out of college, I knew that I had to go to graduate school and that cost Mm -hmm. more money. And I didn't have the time that I needed. Now we realize that we can take some of these breaks off of our children. Mm -hmm. We are literally raising a generation of breaking before they even get to the to the stop yes. sign but they have to break and that's well, you know, not right the, the thing about it is is when you talk about these babies because anybody under 30 is a baby to me right when you talk about these babies especially these little babies experiencing anxiety and stress we have to know that what society is pushing is causing them this distress. We have to find ways to actually tap into. I had someone to say to me, well, I don't understand why a 10 year old is depressed and suicidal. Oh, you don't. You hadn't been living in this world because where you been, right? You know, they have all of this. I said, they, and, and I shared this to a parent today. I said, yeah, they got all this stuff, but they don't have you. Mm. And she said, oh, yeah, it's it's real simple. You can buy them all this stuff, but they don't have you. It's kind of like we got church, but we ain't got Jesus. Mm, Help me with, because we we're in the membership. Right there. And you know, and listen, I know for a fact that I'm preaching real good. Mm -hmm. And I know I'm stepping on my historical toes, as well as the toes of my brothers and sisters who I love dearly who are desperately t- trying to maintain membership because they want people in fellowship. I get it. Yeah. But you know, it's like what you're saying about the child. We really want to get them with relationship. Mm-hmm. So we have to put in perspective this idea, this ideology that membership is everything. In yeah. other words, it, it, it has its place. I think the foundation of the church is to feed the flame of the gospel, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And People will show you how they feel with their finances or they will, they will either move their finances or they'll move their feet. You'll know how people are moving in the church. You ain't got to worry about counting the membership. You know, you'll know if you're hitting it right or wrong, period. Right. That's just data. Right. But when you remove some of that out of the way, it just makes me so, I get a holy discontent. Yeah. I think that because we don't allow people to just exist and and get the standard. And I use standard coming out of K-12 education mm-hmm. because it's just this rapid moving from standard to standard. And then there's this fear. Oh my God, mm-hmm. my child didn't get the last three standards. What does mm-hmm. that mean? I had exactly. to be sure I had to decide these standards are not gonna ruin, run my life. They are not gonna run my children's life. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna love my kids every day the best I can. I'm going to tell them to do their very best. And I'm going to trust God that that's what they did. And when they didn't, I think it's, they'll feel it. And mm-hmm. that's my only job is to steward them and make sure they get what they can in this day, not get what that standard, what that, that guided. It's just mm-hmm. the standard lectern. In the church, we call it a lectern. In the school, we call it a uh, standard-based learning. And it's on a schedule. Yeah. It's all scheduling. It's all scheduling. You and know, and that's not really fair to the organic experience of a person. Yeah. Correct. And, and, and it, you know, we, uh, again, we could talk so much and so about so many different avenues of how the crossover between life 
and religion and mental health. What would you say to the generation of people, whether young or old, who are in the church, but afraid to get the help that they need? What would be your words of encouragement for them to come and see you? Yeah. And get okay. their help. Oh, this is this is my sweet spot right here. So <laughs> well, so let me just say this that pastors are so undervalued. Mm-hmm. One, of, one of the ways that our modern church has set up, and I think this is just the evolution of time. I don't want to say it's anybody or particular group of people's fault, but just human nature. We have, for whatever reason, thought that you're supposed to get everything from the preacher, the person mm-hmm. that's going to give you a word. It take, let me tell you, people are putting together Martin Luther King worthy sermons every Sunday. I right. listen to a lot of sermons on Sunday. I listen to sermons all throughout the week. Sermons are like major speeches. People are praying behind this. They're going back and forth. They're running it by other people because when they go before people, they take this stuff seriously. Yes. Now, is that in some way pastoral care? Absolutely. For Mm -hmm. somebody to think enough of you or whoever may sit in that pew to put something together based on something that is foundational, to the Mm -hmm. Christian disciplines of life Mm -hmm. and the Christian way and understanding who God is and what you can have. That to me, let me just tell you, every time I have to preach, I have gas real, real bad in every area of my body. I have to burp. It's in here. It's in my thighs. I'm Mm -hmm. just like, oh my God, Jesus, Lord. Now I can sit and do this counseling thing and do my scriptures, my one-on-ones, my groups, all of that. But the moment I have to get into, my uncle just asked me to preach. I almost broke out in hives because I understand the responsibility. And that responsibility is huge. It is. I I remember years ago, probably 25 years now, someone did a study on the amount of energy that a pastor uses to preach a sermon. And that one hour to 45 minutes equated to eight and a half hours of a job. Oh yeah. What people fail to realize, for those of us that are called to go in front of folks, uh, the scripture that stands out for me is woe unto them hmm. that lead the sheep astray. My, 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 my. I can take a well, Marcia, I cannot take a chance on leading someone astray because I like me too much. Yeah. Right. I know that there are a lot of people who may not be afraid to do that, right? But our truth is this. We have to be accountable for the words that come out of our mouth. And when you know what anointing is on your life, you don't take risk like that. Mm -mm. And and for me personally, I I have to put that kind of weight in that Mm -hmm. statement about pastors, because I know the gravity, I've been there. However, I think that there's this expectation, or maybe it's a mentality passed down from generation to generation, Mm -hmm. that your pastor can in some way provide you pastoral care, or some type of pastoral counseling, or advocacy, mentoring, coaching, all of those things that we see, wise counsel right? Mm -hmm. Now, I think Mm -hmm. a word is wise counsel, but a lot of times a word is something that you're trying to fit into the narrative of your life. Mm -hmm. It is not what we understand as individual pastoral care. Now, I am a certified pastoral care counselor. I'm also a certified Christian therapist. Mm -hmm. If I want to be a licensed professional counselor, I can. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, none of that matters. What matters is the amount of time and specificity somebody can spend on your life. Mm -hmm. To expect to get all that you need from the pulpit is too much for that man or woman to have to bear. It's also too much expectation for you to have to receive. Mm -hmm. So in other words, all of the expectations are out of order if you think that that's all you need in life. So I'd Mm -hmm. like to suggest that if you have a primary care physician, if you have somebody that specifically takes care of your dog, If you got somebody that specifically helps you with your financial outlook and your retirement, 
how much more so the, ca the care of your, your heart and your mind, which is one place pretty much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And your soul actually has to have love and compassion. Yeah. I give people a lot of empathy, a lot of love, a lot of compassion, a lot of space to be. You do the same. The yeah. reason we do that is we bec because we know that that's not enough. Yeah. It's just not. Not because I say so, not because Marcia says so, because it is so. It and is because so. the word says that it's so, that we should walk in wise counsel. Wise. So to have that absence from your, and I have people, and they're just like, I just can't get my life together. I, I've had a mentor since I was 21. Mm, he okay. is still my mentor to this day. Mm -hmm. I, I talked to her probably about an hour before I spoke to you. Mm, um, okay. And I don't know how I, I'm telling you, I would have lost hope had I not believed I was going to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Mm. And I did not have Miss Trudy Diana. Now mm -hmm. I have a very present mother who I look up to. I have great matriarchs. My grandmother's lived forever. My grandfather, I've got all of those pillars in place. I'm just blessed. When I tell I, this is why I do what I do because right. I have so many pieces of my life that are in place, even seemingly when my whole world is shook, that mm -hmm. I don't have time to be playing around. I do this mm -hmm. as a specific calling on my life. So if that is you, if you're if you're young, if you're in college, if you're a young adult, if you're thinking about getting married, if you're thinking about shifting careers, if you're thinking about having a baby, if you're just thinking about if you want to keep living, my suggestion is that you get with somebody who's interested in you, mm. who's mm -hmm. interested in you having those things. And it's not a mirage. It's not a mistake. Every good and perfect gift comes down from the father of lights. Yeah. And Unlike man, there's no flickering lights in God. There's no variation. Mm -hmm. So all of those gifts, all of those cherry blossoms in your head are real. It's not a mistake. The pain you feel is real. And mm -hmm. we are here. We lay in wait to fulfill our calling to support your life. Yes. So if that's not faith-based therapy, I don't know what is. I don't know what is either. <laughs> I, I, I don't know what it is. I mean, I couldn't have said it any better um, because it's what is true. Yeah. You have to start where you are. You have to trust and understand that even going through life's trials and tribulations, you're still here. You still have the opportunity to be your absolute best self. Exactly. Don't try to navigate this thing called life alone. No. Don't do that to yourself. It's too much pressure to try to navigate situations and circumstances that you don't even have a clue, that you didn't even invite into your life. It was just thrust upon you. Get you a therapist. Like Charnay said, find you someone that is actually invested in you living mm -hmm. and being your authentic self. Because when you find that person, right? And I don't mean no harm, but it ain't mama and them, daddy and them, auntie, cousin, uncle, friend them. It ain't none of them. Yeah, because the truth is, is what you need to get your life on track needs to come from someone that's been anointed to take you there. Shanae, so tell us, how can we find you on social media? Tell us some things that's coming up about you. OK, so so my name is spelled C-A-A-R-N-E. So that's Charnay. I know it doesn't sound like it, but it is what it is. And it will never be anything else. However, my business, my ministry, um, my brand is Charnay by Grace. S-H-A-R-N-A-Y. Charnay mm -hmm. by Grace. That's Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, where social media is sold, all those places. And YouTube. I also have a YouTube channel, which I love and I nurse because I put all of my devotionals there, some of them for free. Um, some of them you can purchase through my website, Charnay.com, S-H-A-R-N-A-Y by Grace, or you can just say my first name, C-A-A-R-N-E, 
Com. I got so much coming up, Marcia. I'm just going to hit it and quit it real, real quick. Mm-hmm. First thing I got coming up is my own podcast, Reverb, with my homeboy and friend and classmate from Fisk University, Tim Hughes. He mm-hmm. is a social activist, and we talk about those things that reverberate in our community and with our people. And this month, um, well, the month coming up in April, we're talking about stress. Mm. Yeah, stress. And we're going to be talking about it from all kinds of vantage point. But how do we, how does stress reverberate in our lives? So that's coming up, I think, the first Sunday in April. Um, If we push in just a little bit further, I have an amazing healing event coming up Juneteenth. It's going to actually be on June 17th in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm very excited about that. Um, Myself and one of my other fifth sisters, Satyana Coachella, who is a uh, yoga nidra instructor as well Mm -hmm. as, I think they call them yogis. Mm -hmm. Um, She's also a mental health practitioner. She owns her own practice. She has about eight amazing associate um, practitioners under her. And we're going to be here and I'll be sending more of that to you, Marcia. Um, It's just going to be healing and peace. And we're just going to walk away whole. We're not just going to be talking about our issues. We're just going to come as we are. And we're going to receive until our cup runneth over. So that's June 17th. More to come on that. Marcia, you are life. I love you so much. I'm so grateful for you. I love you dearly. Listen, you all, as we go throughout, don't forget, check out all of Charnay on any social platform, YouTube, check out that YouTube page. I'm telling you, the devotions are amazing. You can catch the podcast Authentically Peculiar with Marcia on Spotify, Apple, and on my YouTube page, Authentically Peculiar with Marcia. Until next time, understand that it's so important that you live an authentic life. See you soon.